Atlanta is one of my favorite shows from the past couple of years, and I am a huge fan of Donald Glover, both as an actor and a musician. But now we finally got the long-awaited season 3 of Atlanta. The first two seasons were excellent because of its unique Afro-surreal take on black culture through the lens of four friends in Atlanta, and I was excited to see what they would do in season 3. And I enjoyed this season, but I gotta say this was probably the most scatterbrained of the three seasons, because while you have episodes that focuses on the main characters played by Donald Glover, Zazie Beetz, Brian Tyree Henry, and Lakeith Stanfield reprising their roles as Urn, Van, Paperboy, and Darius, you had these anthology episodes, which they started doing in season two, like the Teddy Perkins episode, which is probably my favorite, and especially my favorite episode from season two, but this season there was more, which kind of took away from the main storyline. But the anthology episodes, there were some noteworthy ones, like Three Slaps, The Big Payback, Trinity Dubon, and my favorite, Witch Wigga, Poor Wigga. Donald Glover directed some of the episodes, which was great to see his directing eye. I also see what Donald Glover was trying to do by having the main characters in Amsterdam while all the weird stuff was going on in Atlanta. I still prefer the first two seasons, season two being my favorite. Season three is now my least favorite, though it does has its moments which were the standalone episodes, but at the same time, I watched the show for its overarching story with the already established characters. If you really wanted to make an anthology show with different characters and complex themes, then don't incorporate them into the show with already established characters and take away time from those characters. But I will still be nice and give Atlanta Season 3 the thumbs up emoji. Moon Knight just wrapped and I'd say I enjoyed this show and it was fun and interesting learning about the character because I knew nothing about him and yet everybody and their daddy make a big deal about him so I was curious to see what this show would do f for people not familiar with the character and while this show may not be as dark and violent as everybody makes him out to be there are still some dark elements to develop the character and there is more of an emphasis on the Egyptian elements than I expected. I am now curious to see what they do with this character in the future and what role he plays in the grand scheme of things. Oscar Isaac was phenomenal playing three different personalities. Mae Kalamaui was a good supporting character as Layla. The force work on the gods such as Khonshu was great and Ethan Hawke always gives 100% in anything he is in and it was great to see him lend his talents to a comic book show. They did a good job setting up the mystery behind Moon Knight and when we see it, it is a gun punch. My gripes with the show is I felt the show kind of dragged a little bit and didn't really get interesting until episode 5. I felt this could have been a movie rather than a 6 episode show, but regardless, I'ma give Moon Knight the hard eyes emoji. It has now been 10 years since the first Avengers film came out, but I did not want to rewatch it because I have rewatched it multiple times over the past couple of years. I just didn't feel like rewatching it. It's too fresh in my mind at the moment, but I still wanted to give you something related to this anniversary, so I wanted to take a moment to reflect back to 2012, which was a huge year, let alone huge summer for movies. This was the first to kick it off and kicked off the summer it did. This film took three years worth of movies and meshed it all in such a way that it made sense. This film took characters from different movies and made them all relevant. Those solo movies were the build up and this was the payoff. And it's crazy at the time, some of us thought this was basically the end. How could they ever top this? But little did we all know, especially after that end credit scene, this was gonna get even crazier. And it all started with this film. Yes, the first Iron Man was the beginning. But Iron Man walk so the first Avengers could run. The first Avengers gets the hands up emoji because it's a master. With Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness coming out this weekend, I wanted to revisit the first film, which was the character's introduction into the MCU. I remember when this first came out, I liked it, but I wasn't too thrilled with it. Some factors as to why was because this was the movie where you really started to notice the Marvel formula right down to the comparisons to Stephen Strange and Tony Stark. An underwhelming villain, the controversy around Tilda Swinton playing the H1, which was problematic with some people, and was a lose-lose situation for the director in regards to that casting, and why the film did a good job at setting up things that would become relevant in future movies, I felt overall this was a pretty mad film, but as time went on, I've come to appreciate this film. Six years later, and this film got better with time with me. The things I did like still worked, like the stunning trippy visuals, Benedict Cumberbatch as Doctor Strange was a magnificent, it was cool watching him go from an arrogant prick to learning the era of his ways to become the Sorcerer Supreme, his inclusion in other movies make this film better, it may not be the best MCU film, but it's an underrated gem and I highly recommend you give it another watch. 
I give Doctor Strange the hard eyes. Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness came out over the weekend and is one of the most anticipated movies of the year for a lot of people, myself included. This film has a lot going for it. It's a sequel to Doctor Strange, a continuation of Wanda Maximoff's story from WandaVision. It's another MCU movie that delves into the multiverse, and it is directed by Sam Remy, who is known for the Evil Dead franchise and the Spider-Man trilogy starring Tobey Maguire. So it's him returning to the superhero drama. Now this film has split a lot of people because Sam Remy's horror miss either worked for you or it did. I fall on the latter because Sam Remy bought his A-game when making this film. Benedict Cumberbatch gets better and better every time he plays his character. Give Elizabeth Olsen her flowers. This is the best I've seen of this character in my opinion. The multiverse elements were fun, creative, and mind-blowing. America Chavez is a welcome addition to the MCU. I can't wait to see what they do with this character in the future. But my issues with this film, I felt it should have been a little bit longer. They kind of brushed over some stuff that they should have expanded on. They hardly scratched the surface with the multiverse and the repercussions of it. I'll give my spoiler review next week so I can give this film time to marinate, but for now, I'm gonna give Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness the thumbs up emoji. It has now been a week since Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness came out, and now that I've had time to marinate on how I feel about this film, I'm a rapid fire, spoilers and all. I love Doctor Strange's arc throughout the movie, which is, is he happy and why he couldn't be with Christine, which concludes their arc in my opinion. Give Elizabeth also her flies because this is the best she has ever acted at this character, even though it contradicts her character in WandaVision because she is just downright evil. She didn't waste no time showing her true intentions. I know Wong held it down for five years, but is it really fair for him to still be the Sorcerer Supreme? All the multiverse stuff was batshit crazy, I can't wait to watch my home video. That second in credits scene made me roll my eyes, but I love Bruce Campbell. I got nothing on the first one. I wish we could have gotten more of our universe's version of Mortal instead of this alternate version. And as for the Illuminati, I love seeing returning characters and actors in different roles than their prime universe's counterparts. I love the horror elements, especially what happens with Black Bolt in a, in a scene involving a mirror. Despite how small this was as an MCU multiverse movie, I still enjoyed it and there's still room for it in the future and I still stand by my ring. Chippendale Rescue Rangers the movie was released on Disney Plus over the weekend and it's not necessarily a continuation of the beloved cartoon from the 90s but a successor to the film Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And I really mean that because when I saw this, I thought this was Disney trying to do their own Space Jam, but turns out that this is perhaps the best live action animation hybrid film since Who Framed Roger Rabbit. It's been years since Chip and Dale been together since the show ended and are on two paths currently in life. But after one of their rescue rangers pals goes missing, fate brings them back together to solve this mystery and it happens to take place in a world where animated characters exist just like Roger Rabbit. The other thing I was surprised with was that this could have easily been Disney along with other studios that produce animated content just being self-indulgent and they were at times but this movie still had a heart. Chip and Dale are the heart of the story and the movie emphasizes their friendship, but of course the cameos, easter eggs, and references to other animated stuff was the highlight and I thought it was all used sparingly while also taking digs at the current state of animated content both past and present. They particularly do something that nobody expected and I was surprised that the studio that did this version of the character allowed this to happen. If you've seen this movie, you know what I'm talking about. John Mulaney, Andy Samberg fit into the voice roles perfectly. Of course, I like the two leads. They are animated differently, Chip remains hand-drawn, while Dale is CGI. And I gotta say, Dale doesn't even look bad as CGI, unlike some of the famous cartoon chipmunks. I highly recommend this film if you have not seen it. If you are a fan of Chip and Dale, you will be pleased. If you are a fan of animation, you will love this because this film is also a celebration of animation. I'm going to give the Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers movie the hard eyes emoji. I finally got a chance to watch The Northmen, which has been getting a lot of acclaim from both critics and audiences. Too bad that isn't reflected in the box office. Regardless, I will say this was a brilliantly made film with good production value, solid cast giving phenomenal performances, and the director really put his foot in this one. Now, the best way I can describe the plot of this film is The Lion King. And I don't mean that as an insult to the film, I really mean this is like The Lion King. But there is a twist that I did not see coming, and it elevates this movie up for me. It's about a young prince that is denied the throne when tragedy happens, so he runs away for several years. He vows to get revenge for his father, save his mother, and kill his own uncle, and comes back vowing those ideals he does. But he also learns some heartbreaking revelations about his family and that not everything is what it seems, especially how it changes his perception under different contexts and circumstances. Acting wise, 
Alexander Skarsgård, Anya Taylor-Joy, Nicole Kipman, and Clay Bang are the standouts. Robert Eggers, who is known for directing The Lighthouse, his direction really elevates this material by making it grand and epic. My only gripe is that the pacing at times was a bit slow. And there were a few times where I was like, this movie could use a little dose of get a fucking move on. But when it got going, it got going, especially during the final fight and the climax of the movie. This movie is not for everybody, which is why I kept comparing it to The Lion King to hopefully help somebody get into this film. But regardless, this movie is not for everybody. It is not everybody's cup of tea. But if you enjoy this kind of cup of tea, a refreshing cup of tea it is. I'm going to give The Northman the hard eyes emoji. No words can explain how much Spider-Man 2002 means to me on so many levels. It's kind of hard to be objective when reviewing it, but I still think my subjective thoughts on this film are still valid. My most cherished memories of my late father was when he took me to a midnight premiere of this movie because he was a Spider-Man fan growing up as well. And when I saw this film for the first time 20 years ago in the theater, I was mesmerized that they took one of my favorite superheroes growing up that I used to watch on TV all the time and made it work for the big screen. This film got me into filmmaking. One of my first DVDs that I ever got was Spider-Man. I used to watch those bonus features more times than I could count. I was just amazed that they brought a character to the big screen with likable actors, respected older actors, hamming it up on screen, a solid direction from Sam Raimi, and just an all-around iconic film came out at a time period with Blade and X-Men, right after WB dropped the ball with Batman and Robin, but before the Marvel Cinematic Universe became what it is today, before Christopher Nolan not only put some respect back on Batman's name, but some integrity into comic book movies with his Dark Knight trilogy. It was nice going back to a simpler time before everything was connected and old sourpuss filmmakers like Christopher Nolan and Zack Snyder made superheroes all dark, sappy, and depressing and philosophical, when all we want is a fun but competently well-written story with characters that feel like real people. Happy 20th anniversary, Spider-Man, I raise a glass to you. Hands up emoji, because it is a masterpiece. After revisiting the first film, I wanted to go ahead and just revisit the rest of the trilogy. While the first film is one of my favorite films of all time, Spider-Man 2 is not only my favorite Spider-Man film, if that makes sense, but it's also what I think is the best Spider-Man film. Yes, over Into the Spider-Verse and No Way Home. This film stepped it up in every way possible by really testing Peter Parker in ways that worked because he is just trying to balance his life as Peter Parker and Spider-Man, which doesn't work, so he quits. Life is good, but is reminded why he is Spider-Man. To me, this character is at his best when he is tested, but continues to fight the good fight, even if he has to give up the things he wants the most. But he does get MJ in the end. And it would be redundant for me to say that Alfred Molina kills it as Doc Ock. We all know he does. Sam really, really took what worked about the first film and amplified it and advanced the characters in ways that worked. Everybody has their opinion on what they think is the best Spider-Man film, and that's fine. But for me, this is the best because not only works as a Spider-Man, Spider-Man film, but it is a great film, period, and of course, one of the best Spider-Man sequels. I'm gonna give Spider-Man 2 the hands up emoji because it's a masterpiece. Spider-Man 3 is without a doubt where it all went wrong, which is a bummer because it came out such a strong film with Spider-Man 2, but that does not mean Spider-Man 3 doesn't have its moments. But if I can sum up my issues with this film, it is scatterbrained. This script does not know how to balance the plots and the characters that are in this film. There's a lot of moments within the film I wish somebody would tap Sam Raimi's shoulder and be like, hey, that's stupid, let's not do that. Such as Harry Osborn's butler telling him at the last second that he knows what happened to his father, the scientist guy being too lazy to confirm what activity is going on in the collider pit that made the Sandman, and of course, these scenes. Now dig on this. I'm not gonna beat a dead horse. We all know these scenes. We've all had time to process them. They're horrible. That said, the relationship between Peter, MJ, and Harry is developed in ways that work. I did like the action, particularly the final battle, which is why I can forgive this film because of how scatterbrained this film is, and it all comes together in this climax. I did like what they did with Peter Parker. Hating Church Holden was good as a Sandman. I do like the themes this movie was trying to convey. I just wish it was a better film. I don't hate this film. I don't even dislike it. I just think it's a disappointing movie, but I've made my peace with it, and I'm going to give Spider-Man 3 the shoulder shrug emoji. First off, Rest in peace, Fred Ward, who is in this film. Second, it's been 20 years since Enough came out, and I used to watch this all the time, but as I've gotten older and really started examining Jennifer Lopez's movie career, I say Selena is her best performance, but Enough is her best movie because she plays the wife of a cheating, abusive husband and has to go on the run with her daughter, but the husband just keeps coming back, and every turn she takes to rid him out of her life, he finds a way, so she has no choice but to learn how to take matters into her own hands and learn how to fight, which was the selling point of the film, and it takes place during the climax, and when you see it, you cheer for her. Jennifer Lopez, of course, works because because she plays a mother in distress and by the climax she does a complete 180 and becomes a badass and it is kind of believable. 
Selena and Enough are without a doubt, in my very humble opinion, her two best movies. I'm gonna give Enough the thumbs up emoji. It's been 20 years since Insomnia came out, and this was one of my favorite movies growing up, so I had to rewatch it. And over the years, I didn't even realize that it was directed by Christopher Nolan, which is probably why I like this back then. This was Christopher Nolan after he directed Memento, but before he made Batman Begins. This is Christopher Nolan before he became a household name and was trying to make really heady films like Inception, Interstellar, or Tenet. Don't get me wrong, I like those films, Inception being my favorite out of that bunch, but it's nice to see him do something simple like a crime drama with two acting legends like Al Pacino and Robert Williams. Rest in fucking peace. I remember watching this on Cinemax back when I was young and thought, holy shit, Robert Williams can act, because at that time I had not seen Saving Private Ryan yet. This film to me holds up because it's a compelling story about a, an alleged killer putting a cop through a moral gray area in his career in law enforcement when the cop accidentally does something horrific and is affecting his will to sleep, which stresses me out just watching. You also feel the weight of the situation because he is in Alaska, which isn't the most ideal place to live and it doesn't get dark year round in that spot. So he is just a fish out of water in the situation, as the situation just drives him to damn near insanity. This to me is Christopher Nolan's most underrated and underappreciated film. If you have been turned off by Christopher Nolan and his antics about the current state of cinema like I have, I recommend you watch this and it might change your tune about him to go back to a simpler time. But even if you have seen this film, I recommend you give it a rewatch. I'm gonna give Insomnia the hands up emoji because it is a masterpiece. It has now been 30 years since Sister Act and I wanted to revisit it for a number of reasons. Between the two films, the first film is the one I have seen the least and yet the first film is better than the second, which is the general consensus among critics. After revisiting, I can say this film is a fun, wholesome film starring comedy and acting legend Whoopi Goldberg. Other than The Color Purple, this is probably her second iconic role. The supporting cast is just as great as her too. From Maggie Smith, Kathy Najimi, Wendy Makina, Mary Wicks, Bill Nunn, Harvey Keitel. My gripes with this film are more so something that is tied to the second film because I did rewatch the second film and I felt the direction is stronger in that film than it is here. I felt the director didn't put his foot in this film in terms of the filmmaking. Regardless, I still enjoyed this film and I can see why it's iconic, Whoopi shines in this film, and I'm gonna give Sister Act the thumbs up emoji. Sister Act 2 Back in the Habit, as I said, is the one I've seen the most, despite the fact that it is a step down from the first film, but it has gained a cult following, particularly among people my age. Before we were watching, I didn't get why the critics were harsh on this film, but watching with adult eyes, I can see why from the recycled plot points, such as turning the lives of the kids around through the power of music, winning the competition to save the school, plots were bought over from the first film, which made the film even feel more recycled. Some of the acting and dialogue was cheesy, despite the fact that the returning cast took a back seat. The reason this film gets a pass from me is because most of the cast returns. Whoopi is still funny in the role, and it was fun watching her interact with the kids and work with the kids. The music is iconic in its own right. I own the soundtrack on CD at one point. The director of this film is Bill Duke, who I just watched direct deep cover. Of course, the young standouts were Lauren Hill from the Fugees, Jennifer Love Hewitt, who we all know went on to have a good career after this, Ryan Toby, who is known in the music industry and is in the rap group City High. Yeah, you remember them? I understand the criticisms this film got. It is a step down from the first, but I'll always have a spot in my heart for this film. It is fun and wholesome just like the first film, and I'm gonna give Sister Act 2 the thumbs up emoji. It's been 20 years since Undercover Brother came out and I wanted to revisit it because I remember watching this on TV but never watched it in its entirety. Watching with adult eyes, this movie is not only funny as hell, but I see how smart and brilliant this movie is because of its emphasis on black culture and how it pays homage to black exploitation films from the 70s. This movie wears its heart on its sleeve and I love it for that. The cast of this film really makes this movie for me, between Eddie Griffin's hilarious performance as the title character, Ejanu Illis as Sister Girl, Denise Richards as White She-Devil, and some noteworthy other cast members such as Dave Chappelle, Chris Catton, Chi McBride, Neil Patrick Harris, Gary Anthony Young, and Billy D. Williams. This movie has gotten a lot better in age for me. I have a newfound appreciation for this film, and I'm gonna give it the heart eyes emoji.
it has now been 30 years since Sister Act, and I wanted to revisit it for a number of reasons. Between the two films, the first film is the one I have seen the least, and yet the first film is better than the second, which is the general consensus among critics. After revisiting, I can say this film is a fun, wholesome film starring comedy and acting legend Whoopi Goldberg. Other than The Color Purple, this is probably her second iconic role. The supporting cast is just as great as her too. From Maggie Smith, Kathy Najimi, Wendy Makina, Mary Wicks, Bill Nunn, Harvey Keitel. My gripes with this film are more so something that is tied to the second film because I did rewatch the second film and I felt the direction is stronger in that film than it is here. I felt the director didn't put his foot in this film in terms of the filmmaking. Regardless, I still enjoyed this film and I can see why it's iconic, what be shines in this film, and I'm gonna give Sister Act the thumbs up emoji. Sister Act 2 Back in the Habit, as I said, is the one I've seen the most, despite the fact that it is a step down from the first film, but it has gained a cult following, particularly among people my age. Before we watching, I didn't get why the critics were harsh on this film, but watching with adult eyes, I can see why from the recycled plot points, such as turning the lives of the kids around through the power of music, winning the competition to save the school, plots were bought over from the first film, which made the film even feel more recycled. Some of the acting and dialogue was cheesy, despite the fact that the returning cast took a back seat. The reason this film gets a pass from me is because most of the cast returns. We'll be still funny in the role and it was fun watching her interact with the kids and work with the kids. The music is iconic in its own right. I own the soundtrack on CD at one point. The director of this film is Bill Duke who I just watched direct deep cover. Of course the young standouts were Lauren Hill from the Fugees, Jennifer Love Hewitt who we all know went on to have a good career after this, Ryan Toby who is known in the music industry and is in the rap group City High. Yeah you remember them? I understand the criticisms this film got. It is a step down from the first but I will always have a spot in my heart for this film. It is fun and wholesome just like the first film, and I'm gonna give Sister Act 2 the thumbs up emoji. I had never seen any of the Lethal Weapon films, and the third film is getting an anniversary this month, plus I own the series on Blu-ray. That way I'd be ready to watch them all for the first time when I'm ready, and the time has come for that, so for the first film, especially in context with the rest of the series, it's the darkest of the four, but it's still iconic for so many reasons, such as the duel between Martin Riggs and Roger Murtaugh, played by Mel Gibson and Danny Glover, which are for sure some of their most iconic roles. Mel Gibson's story is the heart of the story and would continue to be the heart throughout the series. Shane Black's writing and Richard Donner's direction go hand in hand to make this an excellent buddy cop film that is iconic and excellent. Despite the fact that I wouldn't say this is the series at its most refined, it is still one of, if not the best in the series. Or maybe I'm just looking for a flaw because I don't want to be quick to give this my highest rating just because it is a classic. But Lethal Weapon still gets the hard eyes emoji. Lethal Weapon 2, I would say, is where the series really started to find its stride because it builds on the first film with its action, its themes, and the comedy. Joe Pesci is a welcome addition to the series. The toilet bomb scene was one of the funniest things I have ever seen in an action movie, but somehow kept me on the edge of my seat the whole time. I will say, at this point in the series was when I realized there's something wrong with Martin Riggs, and then I realized, huh, I get it, Martin Riggs is literally Mel Gibson, or a reflection of Mel Gibson in his behavior over the years. As the series goes on, I've come to appreciate Danny Glover more and I've already appreciated him. And this is also the film where I appreciated the family element in this film. So because of that, I'm going to give Lethal Weapon 2 the hard eyes emoji. Lethal Weapon 3 is celebrating its 30th anniversary, which is the whole reason why I am watching this series for the first time. Now, this may not be everybody's favorite in the series, but I am digging where Riggs and Murtaugh are in their journey in this film. Murtaugh is coming to terms with getting old because he is getting too old for this shit, and he is about to retire. Riggs is coming even more back to life because they give him a love interest, played by Renee Russo, and she holds her own on an acting and action level. Joe Pesci returns as Leo, which is not only a welcome addition, but a good reoccurring character. My favorite scene in this film is when Murtaugh is at his most vulnerable when he gets drunk and he has a heart-to-heart -heart with Riggs. This would have made for a good end of a trilogy, but of course there is more left to be done in the next film. I'm gonna give Lethal Weapon 3 the thumbs up emoji. Lethal Weapon 4, I remember seeing bits and pieces of it on TV, but I had never watched it in its entirety, so I'm considering this a first time watch for me. It is also the one that people my age have seen the most, mainly for Jet Li, who is a welcome addition to the series, as well as Chris Rock, who was hilarious, and I loved his interactions with Joe Pesci in the film. I can also see why people my age like this film, not only for those things alone, but because of how the 
film concludes Riggs and Murtaugh's story in a fun, emotional, and satisfying way. I love where we leave Riggs at the end of the film and how he has integrated with the Murtaugh family throughout the series, which sets up the theme of family for the series. My only gripe is that they, they did overdid it at times with the comedy, and the action did get a bit silly at times, but I was thoroughly satisfied with this film as well as watching this series for the first time. I'm going to give Lethal Weapon 4 the Hot Eyes emoji. With Jurassic World Dominion coming out soon, I thought I'd revisit the series, starting with the iconic masterpiece that started it all, for better or worse. But we'll get to the worst later. But for now, let's reflect on the original that is iconic on so many fronts to the complex themes of man versus nature, and just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Don't try to play God and go against the will of nature, which is Drive Home by the Ian Malcolm character played by Jeff Goldblum, and will continue to be hit home by other characters including him. The groundbreaking special effects that still hold up to this day, at least in my opinion, the memorable characters played by iconic actors like Sam Neill, Laura Dern, the late Richard Attenborough, rest in peace, and of course, Jeff Goldblum, who is the philosophical star of this film and the series. And of course, he spawned so many memes. Now, I'm a sucker for dinosaur movies, but as I get older, I appreciate this movie more and more. Of course, all the scenes involving dinosaurs are fun and entertaining in itself, such as the iconic T-Rex scene, the Velociraptor scenes, this shot. It is even my favorite Steven Spielberg film of all time. This is Spielberg at his finest as a director and an innovator of film. I mean, honestly, what can I say about this magnificent film that hasn't been said already? I love this film, it is one of my favorites of all time, and I'm gonna give Jurassic Park the hands up emoji, because it is a masterpiece. The Lost World Jurassic Park is the second film in the Jurassic franchise, and honestly, I don't understand the hate that it gets. Don't get me wrong, it is still a step down from the first film. This is clearly the studio trying to cash in on the success of the first film, but that film was just so tightly structured and put together, you have nowhere to go but down. And for what we got was a fun adventure B-movie directed by Steven Spielberg. But even then, I still wouldn't even call this his worst film. And all that said, it was still a fun movie in my eyes and maintained the fun of the first film from the scenes where our three leads are stuck on a bus that is upside down off a cliff that gave me multiple heart attacks in itself and stressed me the fuck out. We get more dino action than the first, though more doesn't always mean better. What made the first so good is that it built up to the more dangerous dinosaurs. Plus, we do get some silly dino action, which was just a little jarring. There's that infamous gymnastic scene that I would argue is still not as bad as this bit from Jurassic Park 3. Alan. They actually brought a T-Rex to the city, which is clearly the studio trying to have their own Godzilla. Jeff Goldblum does give his best in this film, but he is not as charismatic as he was in the first film. But still Goldblum nonetheless. In the end, I feel The Lost World has its fun and entertaining stuff that a lot of people who hate on this movie tend to ignore, but it's still not the best within the series though. So I'm gonna give The Lost World Jurassic Park the thumbs up emoji. So next up is Jurassic Park 3, and whether you like or dislike The Lost World, a lot of people would agree that this is where the series really started to go off the rails. Gone is the intelligent themes and carefully constructed special effects, and it is the first time that Spielberg is not directing one of these. And you can tell, it is a downgrade in quality from the first film from a narrative standpoint and a special effects standpoint, the practical effects specifically. The mechanical dinosaurs look like theme park animatronics. The CGI does not hold up even by 
and I swear to god the characters are dumb as hell. My biggest gripes about this film is what some would consider nitpicks, but I don't care. Like seriously, why would you go parasailing over a dinosaur infested island with no supervision? So Alan and Ellie are not a thing, I thought they kind of established that in the first film, but here they just not together. They really bamboozled Alan Grant to go to the island, let alone an island, a dinosaur infested island that he did not go to specifically. Stop yelling and screaming! How can you hear a cell phone through a dinosaur? How does a child survive six weeks drinking dinosaur piss? I swear the humans in this movie are so stupid! And of course, this infamous scene. Alan. That said, I can still pass this off as a fun little B-movie, but Jesus, this was just so bad. Not horrible, just bad. And it, and it was about to get a lot worse in the not-too-distant future from there. <laughs> but anyways, Jesus, I'm gonna give Jurassic Park 3 the thumbs down emoji.